everybody, and welcome to episode 21 of the Shine Sparkers podcast. I'm Amanda Van Heil. I'm going to be your host today, and I'm joined by Darren and our very special guest, Jack Matthews. Jack, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do and how you worked on the Metroid Prime games? Uh, hi. Yeah, my name is Jack. I worked on all three of the Metroid Prime games. I was the technical lead engineer on the first two and principal technology engineer on the third one. Um, I worked on a lot of the graphics stuff, a lot of the engine pieces. I sort of touched a lot of the things that weren't AI or sound or other things. But yeah, a lot of the core subsystems were things that I worked on. I also, after that, started a studio called Armature Studio that I was at for eight years before leaving in 2016. And now I live in Chicago with my wife and uh, new baby. Since you last spoke with the Shine Sparkers team, Metroid Dread has come out. Now, have you played it? Oh, yes. Yes, I have played it. All right. What do you think? What do you think? I really enjoyed it. I I mean, I have a soft spot in my heart for the 2D Metroids, and I was really just... I. I I needed it. You know, I've also, you know, I've got the got the new baby and so it's hard to make time to play that kind of thing and uh to play games in general, but I sort of made time like every nap was time to go play Dread and um yeah, I really I I I just love those games. I love the the Sakamoto side scroller Metroid games and I thought Mercury Steam really hit it out of the park. It was so good. Oh my gosh, I loved it. I just I love that game so much. It's funny because I, I just played a second playthrough and actually in the first playthrough, I did not like the Emmys like at all. But in the second playthrough, I actually kind of dug it. Like I, I sort of uh, found their patterns and found the way around it. And, and I and I got to got to appreciate the Emmys on the second playthrough. And I feel like what's great about the 2D Metroid games is you appreciate a lot of things on subsequent playthroughs, which is really fun. Yeah, the Emmys made me cry when I first <laughs> experienced them. They gave me nightmares. Like, I was crying the first time. Like, it just stopped chasing me. They're definitely formidable. Yeah, when that when that animation, when they, when they kill you... Um, spo- oh my gosh. Yeah, and they, like, hit you through the heart, and it's always slightly different timings and different, you know, pieces. But, man, that is... That is something that just, yeah, it is it, that inspired terror uh, a lot. Yep. Yeah, it's really satisfying when you can land that counter, though, isn't it? And just get them off Absolutely. you. Absolutely, like run out of there. You feel so cool every time you land that counter. <laughs> yeah, there was one time where I did it three times in a row. I have no idea right. how I did wow. that. Yeah, and I was, you know, it was like when you're playing the Emmys. I mean half the time you're just wanting to throw your controller at the screen or i guess just throw your switch if you're not playing on a screen but like (laughs) um but yeah i had like three in a row and i was just like wow i must have done something right because i mean i feel like it's almost random if you land it or not and yeah it was it was nice was it worth the wait all those years of rumors and speculation to get a sequel to fusion you know 19 years was it worth it i mean yeah, I, well, I mean, it's like, what's the alternative? <laughs> 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 not not getting it, I guess. But uh, yeah, I, I, I would say so because one, I really liked. Well, I liked it being on a on the Switch. I really mm. liked having the three D graphics and stuff. Like there were certain parts, like um, oh goodness, I I can't remember any of the area names, but there was one with like a ton of lava where the background was this big like plume of lava going straight up and it was just gorgeous and i felt like that wouldn't have translated well on the 3DS at all i felt like there were a lot of visuals that i was just happy to see on like the big screen uh with a side scroller game that mm. just would not have landed on the 3DS cuz mercury steam previously made Samus Returns, which was on the 3DS, and it's virtually identical game engine, but I feel like it really shown here. Uh, I was also really happy to be playing it at 60, and I felt like the animations that they were able to do on Samus in this one were honestly pretty incredible and something that they wouldn't have been able to accomplish on prior generations. So yeah, I'd, I'd say it was worth the wait. I, I I'm curious for you guys... What do you got, what do y'all think of the story of the Sakamoto Metroid games? Just just the whole story or the story of of where Dread fits in? 
Uh, I'm talking about like, cause dread sort of caps off a big part of the story. And, you know, like I worked on the Metroid prime games and we virtually weren't allowed to have a story because we were sort of segmented into this one narrow section of Metroid at large. And so I was curious, you know, cause basically we had super Metroid, which wasn't much of a story other than killing mother brain. And then we had no other, and then we had Metroid fusion, which had the story of Adam and everything. And then there were no other Metroid games, no other Metroid games. And then there was uh, Dread. <laughs> and uh, that sort of caps off, and I don't want to spoil it too much, but like it sort of caps off sort of Samus's story with Metroids and with the Chozo stuff and everything. And I was just curious what you guys thought of that or if you had any thoughts on how that progression went. I think it had some really neat twists that I was not expecting. Um, was not expecting what happened to Samus at the end to happen to Samus at the end. Um, I, that's how I'm saying it without spoiling. <laughs> well, I was going to say people have had enough time to play through the game now. Oh, that's true. That's true. And this is a Metroid podcast, so they may as well like accept accept it. Yeah. So so feel free to talk about spoilers at this point. All right. Well, I like that she turned into a Metroid. Uh, I thought that was a really, <laughs> I thought that was a really cool way to cap off her story and to sort of keep Metroids in a game where two games ago all Metroids went extinct. So I thought that that was um, that was pretty cool, and I was really kind of happy to see that. Yeah, she became the Metroid, or as people in the community have been calling her, an angry watermelon, um, which was, <laughs> it was pretty incredible. But I think it ended quite abruptly. I feel like we should have had a bit more, you know, uh, I feel like with Fusion, you had that big speech at the end, um, and we didn't really get that. We didn't get that closure, it just kind of ended. Yeah, I left it really open, and I liked that bit with Adam, like, at the, the the twist with Adam at the end. I thought that was really neat. Yeah, that one came out of nowhere. Yeah, I liked that. Yeah. We presumed that it was Adam throughout the game. And, and there was there was people online that realized that actually it, was, uh, it wasn't the case and it was all a trick. But um, yeah, it surprised me and I didn't realize until the end. I thought, oh, Adam's gone rogue, rogue, rogue Adam. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't friendly after all. And yeah, I enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. And then the, the bosses I thought were a real highlight too. I really, really loved the boss. I mean, I loved them even though they were ridiculously difficult and hard. I guess what I really loved about the bosses, and they, they call this out in one of the like loading hints, is that all of their attacks are avoidable. And I think that that's a really cool thing. I mean, it, I think it's pretty... I think with the exception of maybe Ridley battles in prior Metroid games, that's probably always been the case. But I really felt like every time I messed up with a boss, I was the one that messed up. And my slow 44-year-old reflexes were the problem. <laughs> uh, but but it was like something that I would I could learn and get muscle memory about, and I really liked it. So, yeah. And then, I, you know, the, the, the abilities were great. The flow was largely good. I, I, yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was a slam dunk. I thought it was worth the wait, definitely. I liked how they expanded on the things that we know and love, like Shine Spark in, but being able to Shine Spark down and down to the left and right. You know, that's new directions and Shine Spark in, but also retaining it as you jump off walls and things and being able to slide and all that kind of stuff was really cool. Um, and yeah, it was just very fluid. Um, you felt really powerful going through that game. And just going back to the bosses as well. Um, it does feel like it is your fault if you've made a mistake. You d you come back to it and you get better and then you can just breeze through it. I, I guess one thing that I would change is being able to damage other parts of the boss um, rather than having to specifically hit a certain point and do a little bit of damage. I haven't been able to go back and fight Kraid yet and do the sequence break to get the morph ball uh bomb the belly button scene the belly button <laughs> scene yes uh, i love that though it was built in there so you could sequence break the game and defeat uh bosses in different ways so yeah that was cool as well yeah i like how you could you could track your own progress like you start off with a boss and you die like immediately and then you just you gradually get through it and how like you see yourself improve like through the boss fight i just thought that's just really neat how you just you can actually see yourself learning the different patterns yeah i feel like it was a master class in that exact kind of boss design of like 
you are figuring out the patterns, you're understanding them, and you're 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 not just hitting a rubber wall and hoping that you get a lucky shot. You're like you're seeing yourself slowly get better and better and better and better, and you feel that level of uh, accomplishment before you finally win and then you can look back and it's like a saga of you just marching through this boss battle you know or shine spark puzzle but uh yeah i mean i honestly i feel like the game should just include youtube links to every shine spark block in the game uh at this point just to tell you how to do the shine spark puzzles but um but yeah the bosses were good and darren two of the bosses did have like separate weak points like the one guy that uh that goes invisible that has the phantom cloak because you could hit his tail or elect not to hit his tail and then briefly the experiment number 57 guy when he puts his arms on the walls then use the storm missiles to hit his arms like that's optional but you're you're i, I see what you mean though which is like the bosses are not they, they're very puzzly they're not your trying to you, you you want a little more of like Shadow of the Colossus uh, types of things where you have weakened parts and things like that, right? A little sure, more dynamicism. Yeah. You put it more eloquently than I did. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I'm i just bad at Metroid. There we go. I've said it. There we go. <laughs> uh, especially that final boss. My God, it took me so long. Um, oh, uh, oh, yeah. Mm. We won't talk about how long it took me. <laughs> oh, God. I know. I, can't, I mean, the number of play sessions it took me to beat him was ridiculous and actually... I was going for a 100%. I was just trying to go for in my second playthrough, actually. I got to him, and then I realized I had 99% of the items. And then I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to get the last item and then just start another playthrough. I don't need to finish this. I don't, you know, everything up to this is the fun part. I, like, played through him, like, a couple of times, and I'm just like, you know, I get the patterns. I remember the patterns. The muscle memory has gone for now, but... I get it. I know how this is going to finish. So, yeah, it's. Uh, I'm actually going to do my third playthrough, like trying to speed through it a little faster, and maybe, maybe not worry about Raven Beak or whatever his name is. I managed to get 100 percent on normal and hard mode, um, so I'm quite wow. happy with that. Well, you're better at Metroid than me. Well, there was that one. Is it in Berenia? The uh, the shine spot puzzle where you've got to just do it in midair and then hold it and then go and do it again. You've got to sort of chain it until you get that. And it's it's just something silly like an item that doesn't really matter. I can't even remember what it is now, but I remember spending ages trying to get that item. And the the satisfaction of actually being able to do it was was fantastic. But yeah, I, I wouldn't make a habit of it. And then I, I look on YouTube and there's people that can do it first try and I'm like, oh, screw these people. Can't can't be done with this. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares about speedrunning? You're like, I hate these people that can shine spark first time. I'm gonna go back to my yeah. site. Shine sparkers. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I have to change the name, aren't I, to something else? Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. What, 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 what would we call the site if we couldn't call it Shine Spark? It's probably Power Bomb or something. I don't know. Wall Jumpers? See, now that's satisfying. The Power Bombs look really incredible in that game. They look Those really, really nice. Neat. Yeah, really powerful. Yeah, they did, they did a really, really good job with, with, with that. I mean, they did a really good job with all the effects, to be honest. Like, I, I feel like they everything is like really really satisfyingly done in the game uh for all the effects all the shots like everything dealing with like samus and everything she shoots and every every way she moves is pretty incredible um in the game and and is a huge achievement like whoever built uh on we, we always call them player packages like like what the the sort of everything that deals with the player directly. That's what we always called them on Prime when we were developing it. And whoever built that like sort of Samus player package with that animation tree and everything like that, they just, they did a stand-up job. I feel like that's one of those things that I'm betting that the team in Japan was just all over Mercury's team about constantly was the way Samus moves, the way she animates and all of that. Like, like I don't know if you've seen some of the stuff where like before you get the morph ball which is really late in this game by the way but anyway before you get the morph ball yep. whenever she uh is standing next to a one block high like tunnel before the morph ball she she puts her hand on the top of that tunnel and then after she gets the morph ball and she's standing there she puts her hand on the bottom so that if she turns into the morph ball she lifts herself right into the tunnel 
it's crazy it, it, it really is yeah and also the the movement and the position of, of samus's feet as well and when she's turning it's just it's all correct so much uh, attention has been put into the way that samus looks and moves and, and and feels when you're when you're controlling her yeah they, they did a fantastic job and it's like this is the benchmark now it's got to be of that quality next time so i will call out the one mystery or i don't even know if it's a mystery so much but like the fact that all of the central cpus for the emmy areas look like many mother brains and those are like many mother brain rooms and all the projectiles they shot at you were the projectiles that were shot at you in the mother brain room on Super Metroid. That's just a coincidence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but I'm wondering, like, are basically all the Galactic Federation, like, computers mother brains? They're mother brains babies. <laughs> Trying to be mother brains are all based on that technology, I think. Yeah, I just thought that was kind of cool. I, I thought it was neat that they didn't explain it, but I loved that, like, sort of art uh, throwback to all of that. I thought that was cool, too. They were relatively the same, and I would have liked to have seen... A variation as i went through and they got a little bit more interesting but it was like oh it's this room again oh okay well, i need to do this and so it just felt that was a bit repetitive uh, for each emmy but um but you know small small issue there not not enough to say that the game was bad um it's it's very good uh very strong very strong release from mercury steam yeah yeah, in fact, it, th those were, those did remind me of in Samus Returns how you had to battle like fifteen like identical Metroid bosses in Samus Returns, and so it actually did evoke that for me. Is like, oh, here we go, like fighting a bunch of identical mini bosses again. Uh, that that did remind me of that, but you know, it was such it was such a minor thing, and you know, really those encounters had almost no tension and they were just kind of like an in-between anyway that it didn't bug me that much but yeah speaking of metroid dread um i'm gonna just move into a few questions and the first question that i've got here for you it's been long rumored uh, that this infamous metroid dread scan in metro prime 3 corruption hinted to a game that was in development at the time and that there was talk as well of like dread being restart in development uh, a couple of times throughout the years by sakamoto and there's been denials of the fact that that dread scan was anything meaningful um but what do you know about it what is that true or is, is there more to it so as far as i i remember and again this could be totally wrong but as far as i recall i believe that that was put in as a reaction to someone reading news about dread i right. i believe the designer who put that in at retro put that in there because he read something about metro dread on the internet i don't think it had anything to do with anything we heard from nintendo or not and I don't. I, I could totally see that slipping through the cracks because Nintendo did read all the scans as they went out. But I almost would wonder if you know one hand didn't know what the other one was doing, or that one just slipped through. But I don't think that there was actual insider information there. It's, it's just kind of interesting. There's been denials of it, and then you know there's people saying, "Oh, but actually there was a game," and so it, it's interesting. I guess I guess all, all I can all I can really say about that is like especially back then was that Prime Two or Prime Three the scan Prime Three yeah it's Prime Three I I would be pretty surprised if we if the person who wrote those scans knew anything about anything that was going on in Japan because Nintendo is a really siloed off company and in fact like the people you know Tanabe San and the folks that we worked with are a completely separate group from the people that make the mainline Metroid games. So I would be pretty shocked if meaningful info actually made it over. That's not to say, you know, I'm sure the person who wrote the scan wrote it because they read about this game, this rumor, thought it'd be cute to talk about this other Metroid game that they heard about. But yeah, I, I doubt there was, there was any um, coordination of information about it. I mean, it could have been, but I, I doubt it. 
So we want to ask about a few mystery characters from the Prime series that hope you'll be able to shed some light on. So we're going to stick with Metroid Prime 3. We were wondering if you could confirm the existence of something known as Indocoons, because in two rooms in the game, there are file names Indocoon Lab and Abandon underscore Indocoon. So is that is there anything you know about that? Like, was that a thing or is it just a name? I feel like that was probably someone being cute with the Etacoons, which were the cute animals that you could optionally rescue in Super Metroid and I, I don't remember if they're optional in Fusion or not but you know Samus's little little fun creature people I think that that was probably a cutesy reference to those and I would not be shocked if either that was kiboshed or somebody realized that they're not called Endocoons. The file names don't really matter but yeah, I, I have a feeling it was probably somebody trying to do like a little reference to Etacoons from Super Metroid and then it just got didn't happen. I just like the idea that it's somebody that just spelled it wrong and <laughs> they meant it to be something else. Oh yeah. No, that <laughs> that kind of thing happens all of the time because in an ideal world you guys never see the file names. Right. So um yeah, that 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 does not shock me. I'm sure if you looked at a pretty big list of the spellings of area names you'd probably find a decent amount of misspellings or art assets for that matter you'd find a decent amount of misspellings but we tried to exclude file names for the vast majority of files anyways so yeah so it's been confirmed uh that there was supposed to be a, a different boss in place of fardus in metroid prime uh there was some concept art from greg uh Lusniak, um that surfaced and it's known online as ice boss and we was just wondering if you could tell us anything about that and if you knew what its name was i don't because i don't think ice boss made it out of the concept stage um there was never any engineering work done on anything but thardis um i looked at the ice boss concept again just to to study up on it and it sort of looks like a an evolution on the she goth you know like almost like a you know and the she goth was was uh is it was a boss until he became not a boss once you got the plasma beam but like as far as i know ice boss was just a concept and then i remember thardis happened because someone saw galaxy quest and i think it was mark pacini and thought that that would be a really cool idea for for that boss so i i would not i i bet you dollars to donuts that 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 boss was concepted and then thardis just happened instead but there was never any actual work done towards uh, a different ice boss so another critter question in mm -hmm. in prime there are several pieces from the concept art gallery that mention the word monkey in them there's monkey lower <laughs> monkey shaft monkey upper and you mentioned previously on twitter that there was actually an enemy called blood monkeys at one point um what yes. what can you share about those so that was um when we first got metroid prime there was a design pass that was done that i think more closely resembled the project that it came from which was something called metaforce um as far as i remember those designs were much more like uh action oriented game like i remember there were designs were like samus's missile launcher like sort of was was like an autonomous AI almost and would float around and would fire missiles. And, you know, there was a lot more going on on an action type of thing. And I believe that the blood monkeys were, were AIs that were a lot more responsive and akin to, um, to what ended up being the space pirates. Uh, I'm not saying the space pirates replaced them or anything, but I believe that blood monkeys were more like, you know, monkeys that would jump around and attack you. Um, I was going to ask that. I was like, did they actually look like monkeys or were they just called that? <laughs> oh, I, I I don't think. Yeah, I don't I don't remember seeing the concepts for them and everyone talked about them. And honestly, I just thought it was such a funny sounding name more than anything else. I love the name and I would be very disappointed if these were blood monkeys that were not just bloody vicious monkeys. Like if they just we're going to call huh. them blood monkeys. But no, they're not really monkeys. That's that would be a disappointment. Yeah, and so the those three areas of the Chozo ruins that are like Monkey Lower, Monkey Upper, Monkey Shaft. So the in Prime, when 
everything was being designed, art started working on the Chozo ruins first. So most of the Chozo ruins were the were the first areas that were actually built in the game, and those were the those were many of those art assets or the art assets that we used for testing out the streaming tech and everything like that. And so when they were building out these maps, three three monkey every that whole run to the hive totem from the half pipe was pretty much built out first because those were nice proof of concept rooms like the half pipe room with the big tree in it was a nice big room all the other ones were kind of the hallways leading to it and um but i also remember at that point when we were building all those that we had we had we didn't even an ai system built yet and we only had a few engineers on the project to start with at that point and so actually the first AI that got built for the game were the beetles, those uh, beetles that came up out of the ground and um, in uh, Chozo ruins. And so the beetles were built. And then I think it was the wasps after that. So for building out all those rooms and everything, I believe that the blood monkeys went away and sort of got replaced by essentially whatever we could build quickest, which were the, you know, the beetles and the wasps. And also, I think, like I said, with the transition from the more action oriented game to the more exploration oriented game, I think that a lot of the enemies and stuff got simpler and the blood monkeys uh, did not survive that sort of design transition. But the file names did, uh, as you as you see. Yeah. So but yeah, those were those are basically the first three rooms that the artists built and honestly they're not much different from when they first built them either like those are they it's it's kind of crazy because i mean metroid prime was a very fast timeline for building that game and for building basically from the ground up a gamecube engine and a bunch of different game systems that yeah a lot of that art it 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 did not get thrown away we we used it pretty much as is Prior to the production of Metro Prime 2 Echoes, uh, there was a pitch uh, for a single player and co op multiplayer game. And it's known as Metro Prime 1.5. Uh, on the internet, there was a pitch document that was shared a few years ago, uh, and apparently it was considered and later scrapped. Uh, and even though the pitch is available online, we've, we're sort of fascinated by Metro games that could have been. And we were just wondering if you had any personal thoughts about the pitch itself and any interesting insights or memories that you'd be willing to share with us. Uh, I know the pitch existed. Um, it brought back memories when I saw it, and like the doc is definitely formatted. Well, it's written by one of the former designers, but as far as I can recall, there were a lot of pitches for what the game would be because after Metroid Prime was done, Nintendo asked us to make a multiplayer focused version of Metroid after that, which we nicknamed Metroid 1.5. Um, I recall there was a lot of work put into uh, a lot of different ideas. Many of them made it into the multiplayer mode of Metroid Prime 2. Um, but that pitch and a lot of the other pitches were actually focused on giving more focus to the multiplayer side of the game and a really pared down single player that was made to just support the multiplayer. Um, and many of the pitches were like that. And then as we were going through and building what ended up being Prime 2, I think it became pretty obvious that we needed to have a more beefy single player component and that's when the thoughts of like the light world and dark world and everything like that happened and so i think a lot of those pitches that sort of focused on multiplayer with a single player support kind of went out the window um yeah and because i do recall that like when we were prototyping the multiplayer we were trying to prototype having like multiple main characters like i believe there might have even been like at one point i remember someone jumping around as a space pirate um or something like that yeah so it was a lot of crazy stuff going on and so you know that document never made it past um documentation phase but but yeah but there were a lot of things but ultimately anything that would have been written there would have gotten really redone because again like i said many of them were were sort of trying to be supportive of a largely multiplayer game that really wasn't going to happen you know especially on the gamecube because there was almost no online infrastructure behind the gamecube and uh, a purely couch co-op primarily multiplayer 
golden eye type of thing i i don't think would have really been successful at that time you mentioned other pitches there is there and, and i respect this is like nearly 20 years uh since but was there any other pitches there that we don't know about that you might be able to tell us about any other ideas that was kind of scrapped or thrown out you know i mean other than the space pirate thing that i told you about that that's the only one that i can that i recall um unfortunately you know i didn't a lot of stuff happened in the design department that i simply was not privy to because i had my head down code, coding a lot of sure. it um but yeah but i know a lot of people pitch stuff i just don't recall you know much of it making it to someone working on it in the engineering department which is really when i think the rubber hits the road of like okay if an idea is really an idea then that's when we're gonna see it you know what i mean i remember i did a i god i can't remember if it was for prime three or prime two i remembered i i got bored and i'm and this was not by any any means a pitch but i did some scripting stuff to test this i was trying to think of like I called it Metroid Prime Time, where I was trying to do like a time a time stop thing, um, and was trying to like set up dumb little puzzles for if you stopped time, uh, like you could still like bomb and stuff, but like your shots would freeze in the air, so you'd be shooting, then you'd stop time, run around, move something around, and then let the shots hit it, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, that was fun, but that would have never happened, and honestly, any any pitch that's built on a pun is probably not going to move forward probably not no but i like the idea that sounds really fun if it was possible i think that that would have that would have been cool maybe on uh hardware that wasn't gamecube maybe. oh it was it was oh it was possible actually it was really was it possible on the gamecube i was i i was doing it like i actually scripted it up i i had like a little time stop button that would stop some but not all the projectiles and it was actually cool because you'd like You'd like walk around and see your power beam shots kind of sitting there in midair frozen and the enemies would be frozen and then you'd move something around and everyone would start back up. It was it was pretty fun. I mean, we had a really good like game engine for being able to test that kind of stuff. So, yeah, that honestly sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> see, I'd like to see that. But it probably doesn't exist anymore. It's probably in the bin. But I mean, it was only on my hard drive. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, Metroid Prime and Metroid Fusion, that being during the GameCube and Game Boy Advance era, they offered some bonuses when linking the two games together using the Game Link cable. So was a similar feature considered for Metroid Prime 2 Echoes and Zero Mission? And if so, what would it have included? Yeah, so I think the Game Link cable thing went out the window pretty quick um you know like that was that was a really cool thing and like having fusion and prime come out at the same time was really was really neat but i think like you could almost count on two hands the number of people that had those fusion link cables you know so yeah i'm not sure what we would have really linked up i mean we linked up the suits in fusion which is really fun but the suits in fusion were like so different that i could i you know that made sense uh to do but yeah i i yeah there were no real plans to link the two games i think the games came out like six months apart also so yeah i i other than like the original metroid so uh me and uh zoid had actually hacked in super metroid uh being emulated on metroid prime one at one point um i know that would have been cool to unlock in zero you know with zero mission but I believe there was like some kind of patent with Sony sound chips that was stopping us from emulating Super Nintendo back then. Um, but that would have been uh, that would have been something fun to unlock uh, with Zero Mission uh, if there was a way to link it or something. But yeah, that that would have been a fun unlock. So the last question that I've got here. Retro Studios has developed many great titles over the years, but we know that in some of the earlier times, there's been titles that didn't make it. Uh, in recent times, we've learned of projects that didn't come to fruition for various reasons. There was a, a game that was going to be based on uh, the character of Sheik from the Legend of Zelda series, and a game focused on Boo from the Mario series. I think the the, the Boo game was going to be like a DSi were game, I think. Um, and I'm just curious, and I'm probably pushing my luck here are you willing to share any information on titles that didn't make it to release we already talked about the projects and pitches but is there any more that we might not be aware of that you might want to share uh I, well i'm not going to talk about anything that was after prime three uh oh, go but on. <laughs> <laughs> sorry please <laughs> 
I mean, it's been pretty well publicized that Retro had, you know, four titles prior to Prime One um, that were in that were, you know, were were pretty pretty heavy development and got canceled at sort of various times, which were a football game. I believe it was going to be called NFL Fever, American Football, Darren. Mm, yep. Yep. <laughs> um, there was a, there was like a car combat game that was called. I forgot the name of that one. I just called it car combat all the time. Uh, Metaphors, which is the precursor to Metroid. And then Runeblade, which I think became Ravenblade. Um, and so, yeah, there were there were four titles under development. But, you know, Retro back then was also doing... They had like a core tools and technology team that was the bulk of engineering before things sort of got split off onto game teams. So actually Retro had like a big unified game engine um, that sort of everyone was working on together prior to prior to probably around the time when retro landed metroid is when all of the game teams really started to um pull all their stuff together uh and then as the game and then what happened is basically all four games were in development and then at one point the four games kind of became two games because nfl the gamecube was not going to be released in time for the nfl game to come out at the right time and madden was a juggernaut and i think nintendo just realized they didn't need to make an american football game and then from what i'd heard miyamoto just did not like the idea of the car combat game he didn't like the idea of cars with guns on them so um most of the car combat team got merged into metroid and most of the um most of the nfl team got merged onto raven blade and then those sort of continued in parallel for a really long time until um till the raven blade project was deemed infeasible like they just it was going to be way way expensive it, it needed too much and it was going to be really hard so then um some of that team was merged into the rest of the metroid team as well and that's when retro became a one project studio but none of those three games uh, of of those three canceled games raven blade raven well car combat was the actually the one that was the most fun to play but raven blade was probably the one that was closest to it had the most art assets in it and stuff like that and that was more like an rp like an rpg um type of game but yeah so the, the those those were those games and then metaphors metaphors didn't i i don't recall ever seeing like any actual engineering that was done meaningfully on metaphors in terms of like getting a player up on the screen i think most of that actually started when we got metroid and started kind of stitching all the tech together because i think that's also about when we started getting gamecube dev kits and could really you know um could really move forward on real development uh on that because prior to that we were just developing you know like a windows version of the engine and you know using uh direct x and everything like that so just to confirm that Metaforce, the game that was being worked on before Metroid Prime, became Metroid Prime. That's right. In fact, like there's a ton of stuff that the Prime World Editor guys have found that has Metaforce still in the game. Um, and I believe a lot of the build tools still referred to it as Metaforce even, even after Prime was done. So yeah, Metaforce definitely became Metroid Prime. And, and just before we, we leave that segment, I was curious, what can you tell us about Ravenblade as a game, like its concept, its story, its characters? Because um, you said there's like lots of art assets and stuff for that. Can you just sort of give us like a, a, a visual of what that game could have been if it was made? Oh, gosh. Um, all I, well, I remember it, it had like a tome of stuff written about it that I honestly don't know much about, but it had like, a really really large fleshed out story um and i know that it was intended to be a full-on rpg but then as it sort of moved forward it was getting cut into more of like a um third person i wouldn't go so far as to say like devil may cry but like third person magic action game the idea was that it would have a really really deep deep story and like i remember <laughs> I remember, I think near, near around the time the game got canceled, I remember one of the audio engineers told me that just to record all of the VO, it was going to take like twice as long as the game had left in development. Um, you know, so it was, it was, it was to have a really rich and deep story, but to be a um, not turn-based, it was going to be like an action 
um thing and so like their last prototype that i'd seen had like a lot of sword play had like magic stuff and um the idea was i remember there was the idea of essentially being like oh i know what i'm thinking of what were those games that um that like dynasty warriors i think uh where they have like lots of guys rushing at you and you're just sort of plowing through them and i think they did a few zelda knockoff you know yeah zelda there's push. like the hyrule warriors versions of them yeah. yeah yeah so i think that i think that that was kind of an inspiration was that there would be times when you'd have overwhelming amounts of enemies uh and overwhelming amounts of stuff so there's definitely going to be highs and lows but yeah I, w- I, I would think of it as like third person action intermixed with you know some platforming but mostly like third person action mixed with rpg elements it was it's it, it's hard for me to say because as the game was sort of going through its development processes and as timelines were becoming more realistic more and more things were getting uh changed on it to make it fit within that um but i know that like you know the the name raven blade obviously has to do with a big sword and I and it was originally going to be called Rune Blade, but then I think there's enough games with Rune in the name that the copyright wasn't going to work, so it got changed to Raven Blade. So, I mean, take that from it what you will. A sword with a bunch of runes, you know. Um, yeah. So I, I I know I'm painting a very bad podcast visual, but to be honest, I don't really have a great visual in my mind either, because um, like I said, it, it was it it started it it actually started so deeply written and then i think that they were kind of trying to figure out what the moment to moment game of this vast big story was going to be and then as that started unfolding it became clearer and clearer that they just needed to get things to do in the game and figure out outside of what this grand story is what is actually happening minute to minute and i think that that's where some things kind of maybe faltered or, you know, as schedules and everything became more realistic, it just became harder and harder to really find how do we actually execute on what this story vision is. Well, in this segment, we are throwing it over to Jack to remember Mark Haig Hutchinson, who was a senior engineer at Retro, and Andy O'Neill, who was a technical lead engineer. Uh, Yeah, yeah. Uh, These were both very, uh, some of the most talented people I've ever worked with. They both uh, sadly passed away, and I just wanted to talk about them uh, briefly. Um, I've noticed that uh, Mark especially has gotten, is, has been spoken of quite a bit. And I just sort of wanted to talk about what they, what they did and what they contributed, especially given, um, how long it's been since Metroid's come out. And like I said, they're two, some of the best engineers I've ever, I've ever known. Um, Mark Higg Hutchinson, he will be known primarily as writing the cam- the whole camera system for all three Metroid Prime games. Uh, the fact of the matter is those are probably the finest third-person dynamic cameras that have been in a video game. Um, it was funny when we were pitching Metroid Prime, he, was, he knew that the camera stuff was going to fall on him, and I remembered him... Uh, loudly trying to say how are we gonna do first person ball are we gonna tip the camera all around are we gonna (laughs) rotate it and make everyone throw up i remember he he saw that as a particular challenge and then then the next challenge was wait are we gonna be able to turn into a ball like anywhere like are they gonna like stand on a on a plate and then they're in ball mode or what and then when it was like deemed that it needed to be happen anywhere he it, it, it was realized how gargantuan of a task this was. And I cannot stress enough how much work and love uh, this man put into, put into that system. He also was a person that spoke up for the people in the studio. There were quite a few meetings and especially when they dealt with crunch or when they dealt with a lot of things that would impact all the employees 
where Mark would be the guy that would stand up in the room. Mark was always the grown up. He was older than most of us that were working on the game. And he was always the sort of grown up in the room. And he was always the guy that would stand up and speak for us and was someone that was sort of unique in the industry because he had this leadership that was an emotional leadership. He did not have direct reports. He didn't have employees under him, but he still had this kindness about him, but also this, everyone knew when he spoke up that to listen and, and everything he did was out of kindness, out of niceness. Uh, another thing a lot of people might not know about Mark is because he was so well trusted by everybody and by the Japanese even, uh, that when the we was first being prototyped. I don't know if people know this, but or remember this, but they demonstrated the Wii Remote uh, on Metroid Prime 2, on a custom version of Metroid Prime 2. And he was actually the only person at Retro for the longest time that was allowed to have the prototypes of the original Wii Remotes. He actually had a drawer that he locked before he went home every night. And that drawer had just a circuit board and two <laughs> weird sticks on wires coming out of it. And those are the original Wii remotes. And he was actually doing the work to build the initial controller stuff to basically do do the uh, first-person controls that ended up being the underpinnings of the first-person controls in Prime 3. Um, so, yeah, Mark, Mark is was a fantastic guy. Uh, when he was on his... When, uh, when one of his passions near near the end was that he wanted to write a book about the cameras. He wanted to share his knowledge because that's how, that's how great of a person he was. He wanted everyone to be able to know how to do what he did. And he unfortunately passed before he could finish his book. And a number of us helped to finish it for him. And I highly encourage anyone who's interested in reading about what he did and and everything uh, it's a book called real time cameras you can still buy it on amazon um i believe the i believe the proceeds go to his family and um i'd highly encourage people to read it and that was that was mark um another engineer that i wanted to talk about uh is andy o'neill uh, andy he he passed away much more recently um and he was one of the smartest people I've ever known in my life. Um, if I'm being honest, he and I had a bit of a weird, I don't, I mean, it was contentious at times. A lot of people had contentious <laughs> with Andy because he's, he's a very, very smart guy, a very bold guy. And you always knew you, where you stood with him. And so he was actually the technical lead on the car combat team. I was the technical lead on Metroid when the two teams merged we became co-technical leads actually but the amount of uh stuff he he contributed to metroid was huge i mean he did he did the spider ball he did i mean on the core technology side he did all of the static lighting so all of the all of the lighting that you see on the environments for that is all light mapped and everything he wrote all of those tools he wrote all the visibility tools so like if you're standing in front of a wall and it's not rendering the things behind the wall, Andy did that. He did almost the entire particle system stuff, tools and implementation of the particles, uh, and it, it, you know, to give the artist the ability to have amazing special effects. Um, he did the spider ball. He did all of the tech, a lot of the collision tech for things like the uh, ice spreader in Prime One. He did the play, flamethrower in Prime One. He did, he did all sorts. Uh, he did the screw attack in Prime Two. Like it just goes on and on. Like like this guy touched so much of the game and did so much um, for it. After after um, after Prime Two, he left Retro to go start Blue Point Games, which they have done a ton of ports and had a ridiculous amount of notoriety but andy andy was was a force of nature um he was the guy that 
<laughs> when Hank Hutchinson would stand up in the meetings and he would be the one that would yell and walk out. And that's when you knew you'd pushed the team too far and that you'd pushed people too far. He was, he was a guy that, you know, would, you knew what was important and what was not around Andy. And I, I'm going to miss him. Um, after, particularly after uh, he had left Retro, and then after I had left Retro, uh, Blue Point and Armature actually had a pretty close relationship for a while. Uh, we officed out of their office right afterwards, and then they officed out of ours, and then we ended up in the same building together. And so it was, yeah, it, it's hard. And I know Andy is not as probably well known in the community as as Mark is and as other people are. And so I just wanted to make sure to let people know what special people both of these guys were. And and I I personally miss them and I think the world misses them. And um yeah, I just wanted to talk about them briefly. So thank you very much. No, thank you for sharing that. It's um it's hard to know what to say, <laughs> really. I definitely liked hearing the stories though about them. That was really neat to hear. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, there, there, there's a there's a human side to a lot of this game development stuff that is very. Hard. It brings you very close to people when you work sixty, eighty, eighty hours a week. Sometimes you you see you see what really makes people tick. You see you see who they really are, and they truly do become a family to you and when you lose someone in that family it's 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 gutting and and it's hard but i think you know it's it's always good to remember that that there's people making these games you know that that we're that we're all human and we all care about each other and that the love that goes into the games is also the love we all feel for each other and and yeah All right, so here's a discussion for all of us. Let's say there was a remake of Metroid Prime for the Nintendo Switch. What are some, like, maybe quality of life improvements or changes that you'd like to see if it were to come to the Switch? And where would the Metroid series possibly go next under Retro Studios? So, regarding Metroid Prime 1, I, I, I think the two... The two quality of life things I'd probably want to see on the Switch would be, one, the controls. Uh, I actually, you know, I adore the Wii controls that we did for Prime 3. But I uh, I went back somewhat recently and played the GameCube version of Prime 1 again. And my hands nearly fell off. Uh, it's it's The controls are so... I don't want to say bad. It's just like we've evolved first-person controls since then. And... I think that the controls could definitely use a um, a new look. Uh, I would also say that just on the rendering side of things, I, I would actually keep most of the geometry, like the world geometry and everything the same. I would just say that I'd probably do an update to uh, the shaders to use what's called physically based rendering, which is the new sort of hotness in the way that... Um, things get rendered and lit right now you know uh the metroid prime games all used a kind of flat lighting model with some reflected things but we didn't use bump mapping or anything like that we 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 tried to throw all of our resources into polygon density into how many how many polygons we actually threw at the screen so i think and i getting the switch to do all this at 60 might be a bit of a long shot but if we could basically do um you know, physically based rendering, which would include like, you know, normal maps. And, um, uh, I don't even know if we need fully dynamic lighting, but essentially normal maps with, uh, with diffuse lighting that takes the normal maps into account. Uh, I think that would be a pretty good quality of life improvement for prime one. And then possibly for prime one, revising the way that the scan visor picks targets i thought we improved on that so much in prime two primes two and three 
that I would I wonder if we want to if, if they'd want to pull that back into Prime One. So those are probably my top three quality of life improvements for Prime One. Yeah, I would definitely want some improvements with the controls, just because they they just you know when you go back and play it, it feels a little clunky. And I mean, that's just because that was still relatively early days of like first person. It wasn't like the beginning, but it was still, I mean, it was still pretty early on with it being GameCube era. So I would, you know, just smooth it up a little bit. And same with like the, I I guess the colorings. I feel like I had to really boost the brightness. And so like just kind of like a smoothing up of, of everything so you can just see it a little better. And I love voice acting. So I just, I want it to have voice acting. I want all games to have voice acting just because I just, I always love games with acting in it. So those are my big three right there. I don't, I don't know if I've got three. Um, but what I do want to say is I'm just so grateful that there's someone else that loves the Wii motion controls compared to the GameCube. I think the, the the Wii controls were a big improvement over the original. So when I played the the Metro Prime trilogy, I loved playing the game with that control scheme. It's fantastic. And I would love to see that applied again. I don't know if it's going to be possible to just take the control scheme from the, the Wii and put it into the Switch. I'm sure there's a lot more work that would need to go into that to make that possible. So anyone that that makes that game if, if it ever happened you know <laughs> good luck to them i would like to see additional things added to the game things that didn't make it originally due to time constraints so there was things like uh, i know that metacrade or crade was going to be in the game at some point and it was cut due to time constraints and i'd like to see that applied you know new areas um so people that have played the original game they have something additional as well um and and a graphical in, improvement overall i think is 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 almost inevitable um i'd also like to see more language support um so more languages that wasn't translated originally but you know any other languages out there that that wasn't there originally in the game i think it would be nice um it makes it a bit more accessible for people so i think those would be the changes that i would like to see I was going to say, uh, I believe the languages were Efigs J, but here, I'll give you guys, I don't know if this is known or not, but here's a bit of trivia about Kraid. So, Kraid was actually f- modeled out, I believe, and then, but we all knew we didn't have time to do Kraid. In fact, the engineer that was like working on Kraid, the running gag was like, well, you're never going to see him in the game. And so, he actually got replaced with the Omega Pirate. Ah, uh, yeah. So yeah, so the Omega Pirate is where Kraid was, and that was because the Omega Pirate was built on the AI of the. Oh God, I forgot what the giant pirates were called, but yeah. So, so if there were to be a Kraid uh, in Prime One, he would be taking the place uh, of the Omega Pirate. They could put him in a different room, I'm sure, a very large room, but they could make a room <laughs> and put him in it, and I, it could be. A I mean, the Omega thing. Pirate room is pretty big. They can make a bigger room than that and put him in there, make Kraid even bigger. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, there is a render online of Kraid and it looks incredible. And it's, it's, it's a shame that, that he's not in there. So what about Prime 4? What does Metroid Prime 4 look like under Retro Studios? Yeah, I mean, I don't even, I honestly don't know what a Prime 4 looks like. Um going to be interesting because i mean we pretty much closed off everything in the uh in prime three with dark samus i i'm not sure like i think it'd be really cool if retro gets permission to actually jump to somewhere else in the metroid timeline um either post fusion or something along those lines I'd like to see that happen. I doubt it'll happen. It'll probably have something else to do with Phazon. I don't know. I never really um, connected with the Phazon stuff, to be completely honest. I I always found it to be a shame in our games that they were called Metroid, but never really featured Metroids. Um, you know, like Metroid Prime, the last boss was a metroid prime but i remembered like 
the Metroids in the other two games, this is something I complained to Pacini about, and I think he just ignored me, which is the right thing to do. Uh, is like, you know, you could almost one shot them with a plasma beam or something. And I think we just sort of washed over that by saying they were like mock droids or like, you know, Talon Metroids that were clones or something. But yeah, so I, I think it'd be cool if there's a way to wedge a future game into actually having metroids in it possibly not doing the phase on stuff and i maybe it'll involve more of the hunters i'm not sure i know i know uh that was a sort of goal was to try to get more of the hunters in which we you know did in prime three to a degree so yeah i'm not i'm not sure where the series goes it's it's weird to like be wedged into the middle of a narrative arc that we know the ultimate end to with Samus, you know? And so, um, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm interested to see where it goes. I'm, I'm not sure, uh, where it goes. What, what about you, Amanda? What do you want to see out of it? Um, you know, I just want to see a continuation of the story. Um, because I was I was sitting here thinking more along the lines of like the different quality of life improvements because more popped into my mind for like, Oh, this would be a cool thing to improve upon. Oh, this would be really cool. Oh, what what <laughs> what, what popped what pop, what popped into your mind about well, the Well, um, what stuff? made me I'm think curious. of it is I just remembered how in Dread the checkpoints were so much more forgiving in Dread than in previous games, and to put that into Prime would be awesome because I hated it when I would die and forget to save at a checkpoint or be on the opposite side of where I needed to be and then I'd die and then go back to a point and I just I loved how forgiving it was in Dread and I'd like to see that again <laughs> so that, that's a good one actually I would agree with that although I do like the idea of having to save because if yeah. you don't save, that's kind of on you. You didn't save. So it's, oh, it's my fault. I didn't save. That's fine. That's yeah, totally yeah. fine. <laughs> but I like that. I think that's good. Um, so yeah, I, I would agree with that. In terms of what I would want to see from Prime 4, um, no Dark Samus, no Phazon. I feel that that story is done. I would like to see a new threat, um, probably Silux. Um I know that at the end of Federation Force, which takes place after Prime 3, uh, there is that little scene at the end where Silux has stolen Baby Metroid. Um, and I feel like that's going to be the premise of, of the story. Um, it would be nice to know who Silux actually is, since they seem to be focusing on him, you know, on him quite a bit. Um, and it would be nice to see some more of those hunters from that uh, universe as well, maybe uh, Trace or someone like that. But ultimately, I'd like to see a new story, but I would like to see references uh, back to the original three games as well. Um, so maybe there'll be like log entries and stuff, or um, maybe Silux is trying to follow in the footsteps of Dark Samus or something, you know, trying to be like a sort of copycat. And I think a new story, a new threat. I'm just glad that it's back with Retro. I think that's its home. I think that's where it should have been from the start. And I'm pleased to see that uh, that, that is going to be a reality. We're going to get Prime 4, which is is great for for everyone, really. Yeah, I, I, I think that it not being with Retro would have been pretty incongruous uh and so I'm, I'm happy it's with them too and i didn't know about the end i, I i'm gonna admit i did not play federation force for more than about 20 minutes yeah so i mean i i didn't play much of federation force and i i didn't know about that ending with uh silux taking a baby ha a hatchling so that's actually kind of cool so i mean if that means we actually do get a metroid in metroid prime 4 that'd be great i also think it might be interesting to bring back the Luminoth or to have them help out in some way, because I, you know, Luminoth are basically, uh, Chozo, but different, you know, but I mean, they're, they're essentially Chozo stand-ins. And so, but they are Chozo stand-ins that live inside the prime side of the Metroid timeline. So I think it would be cool. And I really, I love the Luminoth. Like I love the way they looked. I loved everything about them and i think it'd be cool if they are sort of a friend to samus on the prime side of things so that we're not polluting the chozo timeline i think that would be uh that'd be really cool definitely 
Mm, I agree with that one as well. Yeah, um, Luminoff need to come back. They're popular. People really like them. So yeah, absolutely, they should definitely come back. Um. Yeah. I mean, I'm with you guys. I think the Dark Samus stories played out and it's done. Um. You know, I like the idea of the hatchling. That sounds neat. Honestly, I just want it to happen. That's really like there's not anything in particular. I just want to play it. Yeah, me too. I mean, because I was looking, and it's actually been one thousand years since Retro's put out a game. A so thousand years. I'm, That's I'm, impressive. Yeah, a long mm-hmm. time. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm, I am really, really, really looking forward to see what my friends put out there and see what see what happens because I, 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 I want something great. I, I need something else to play on the Switch. I don't. I don't play like uh, the indie games uh, on the Switch like a lot of folks do, and so I pretty much just buy the the Nintendo tent poles when they come out on the Switch. And so obviously, I dusted it off for Dread, you know, Breath of the Wild, Mario, all those sorts of things. And so I'm really excited to uh, to get something else to play on there. And I I hope they keep it running at 60. That's like my big. That was our big thing on all three Prime games is that they have to run at 60 FPS no matter what. And I'm I'm hoping uh, Retro can can keep that one alive. Yeah, you see, and that that does make me concerned. Really, like, would it be better if it came to next generation hardware? Maybe when there's a bit more power behind the system, is it going to be able to meet the expectations of fans by being on five year old hardware? I mean, Droid, Droid, Dread looked so. I just called it Droid. I was thinking Metroid and Dread, and I combined the two words together. Droid, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Droid looked great. <laughs> yeah, Dread <laughs> looks so good. I think, I think it will be fine on the Switch because it's the Switch really does make things look really pretty when they go with like their first party games are just incredible. Yeah, but first per- first person games are a uh, are a different beast. Um, True. First person first person games are really hard because you you can put the camera anywhere. Like that's the nice thing about a game like Dread or most of the other Nintendo games is the third person cameras. It's a lot easier to control the uh, performance characteristics of something when you can have fairly fixed camera and sort of particle constraints. That was like one of the hardest things for the original Metroid Prime games was to keep frame rate up because you could pretty much put your face anywhere. Um, You know, like we had all these times that it was like someone would put their face against a wall and just shoot as fast as they could and the frame rate would drop and we'd have to fix it. You know, it's so it's so the first person side of it is an extraordinarily complicated problem to solve. And the issue with Nintendo hardware now is like if they can go portable that means that the hardware needs to be not beefy enough to be able to run on a battery because battery, you know, battery technology has not really progressed all that much in the last 20 years. They're just finding ways to cram more batteries in more places by making everything else smaller. And so it's going to be a tough challenge for them to hit 60 on the switch in general. And then, and also though for Nintendo to make like a switch Two that is significantly better in performance unless they sacrifice battery life or have you wear a backpack that's going to be difficult or interesting so i mean like i would love to see it on next gen but i just don't i don't see a nintendo next gen being like an order of magnitude more powerful than the switch um and so that'll be it'll be interesting to see how they how they hit 60 on a switch and or if they are on the switch 2 seeing how much more powerful uh, that thing could be. There's going to be challenges there, but I think there's there's still quite a bit of talent there that you worked with that still work at Retro, and you probably can vouch for some of those people. That, talented people, I oh, imagine. Oh, yeah. So it, I'm sure they can do it. Oh, yeah. I mean, re- Retro... No, I'm I'm sure they can. Retro has some of the smartest people still there, and, and you know, some of the best... The best folks I've worked with are still there and are still lifers, and... That's a great thing about Nintendo and retro in general is they they know when they have talent, you know, they need to cultivate it, keep it. And the other thing is they won't put the game out until it's really good. So it when it does come out, it'll be great um, is 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 what what really matters. Come hell or high water. All right. Well, this is a question for all of you listeners. If Metroid Prime was re-released in 2022, what quality of life improvements would you guys like to see? Let us know by tagging us on our social media accounts to tell us what you think. 
All right. Well, Darren, thank you for being here as always. And Jack, oh my gosh, thank you so much for joining us. It was really great just hearing all of your insight and then hearing your stories with the coworkers that had passed. It was just, it was a great tribute to them and just really just interesting things you had to say. And I loved hearing all of it. Um, so is there anything else you would like to add or anything you'd like to say to the community? Uh, play Metro Dread. And if you are at all interested in coding and knowing some of the stuff that happened that we worked on and that Mark A. Cutchinson did, uh, again, uh, look on Amazon for real time cameras uh, written by him. Well, everybody, as always, thank you so much for listening, and we will see you next mission. See you next mission. See you next mission. congratulations cool. as well and we're so happy to have you oh go ahead I'm sorry. I, I was just gonna say congratulations that i thought you was gonna say something but we ended up interrupting each other so that's an outtake <laughs> straight away okay <laughs> so yeah just carry on amanda i'll just keep my mouth shut it's okay, fine. No, give, yep. go ahead and do that Aaron. <laughs> you do your congratulations and i was gonna say okay cool and then welcome back after your interview back in 20 well that, i was gonna say congratulations but it's been a while now hasn't it because wh- when did you when when did you have he's eight months he, he just yeah, turned yeah. eight months old actually yeah if the it, whole first year of somebody <laughs> having a baby you can congratulate there them you go, like you get a full there year that's great <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you darren you're welcome <laughs> <laughs> Well, Jack, I'm so happy to have you back here at Shine Sparkers. We had an interview with you back in 2018. And let's see, what else am I talking about? And since you're, you came, and since you were, yeah, whatever, brain fog. Hang on, what's the word? <laughs> the word is Darren. Since it's going to hate last... editing this. <laughs> we're not there yet. Yeah, I feel like it was a master class in exactly that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we want to ask about a few mystery characters from the Prime series that hopefully you'll be able to shut shut. Let me try that again. <clears throat> okay, before I ask this next question, can I just confirm Greg's last name and how you pronounce that? Because I think it's Lozniak, but I could be wrong. Oh, I have no idea how to pronounce his last name. <laughs> oh, that's really helpful. You work with the looking guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm just gonna say, Greg. I, Greg I don't. I don't think he was ever. Well, I don't. I don't is. think he was ever an in-house concept artist. So I don't actually know oh. that I've met him in person. So, oh, so was he like freelance then or something that I, coming or e- either he was freelance or I'm a terrible person. <laughs> Pro- probably the latter, but probably yeah, the latter. Anyway, yeah. Question. <laughs> all right. So for all of us, the f- what, what is this thing? Okay. All right, so here's a discussion for all of us. This is regarding Metroid Prime and the future of the series. So theoretically, let's say there was a remake of Metroid Prime for the Switch. Where would the Metroid Prime series go? Wait, what? Oh, okay, sorry. I'm like having to to reread. I'm like... Okay. It, that's my fault because I've worded it wrong. No, I, yeah, I so get it basically, now. It's two things. Yeah. Okay, I get it's it. Met- <laughs> if, a Metro- if Metroid Prime specifically okay. was remade or released on the Switch, um, you know, what kind of quality of life improvements oh, okay. and stuff Got would it, it okay. have? And yeah, because I kind of put it as the as the mailbag question. Right, so, okay. <laughs> and I didn't really add it to the to the main gotcha. discussion question. Gotcha, okay. Sorry. No, you're good. I know. Oh, from, I'll, I'll start. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go on. No, you first. Oh, no, I was just like, <laughs> just coming up with something. I was literally just pulling something out of my ass. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, literally? Yes, literally. Literally doing that. She, Sorry. She's talented, but not that talented. I'm that yeah. talented that I can pull answers out of my ass. I'm just, you know, just special ass <sighs> here. <laughs> Well, that's All definitely right, not going in the podcast. Oh, um, good I know. Amanda's <laughs> Amanda swear jar uh, yeah. runneth over. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, uh, I'll do a pause and then I'll answer the Prime 1 part of it. Okay. <laughs> okay. You know what was also nice? Yeah, were, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, it's just something I thought oh, of. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know about the end. I, I, I'm going to admit I did not play Federation Force for more than about 20 minutes. That's okay. No one minutes. else did either. Um, <laughs> I'm taking that out, by the but way. The, <laughs> uh, what, uh, me saying that? No, no, of me saying that. Like, no one else played Oh, it. okay. <laughs> <laughs> do they let us know on Twitter? They let, that's where they let us know. They do let us know on yeah. Twitter, but we're also going to say Instagram this time because we've actually got someone running the Instagram account now. Oh, okay. Which is, which is great. 
let's see. So I say, let us know on. Well, sorry, what do I say? Twitter and, and just, just, just say. Yeah, just let say, us know on let social media. Know, uh, How's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say that. That's fine. <laughs> Let us know by tagging us on our social media accounts to tell us what you think as far as Metroid Prime. That didn't make sense. Let us know by tagging us on our social media accounts. There you go. Go, There we go. go Perfect. Okay. Yay. Yay. (laughs) As far as Metroid Prime. As far as Metroid Prime. Wait, what? (laughs) 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 All right. Closing. Here we go. Well, everybody, as always, thank you so much for listening, and we will see you next mission. See you next mission. Next mission. You're supposed to say, yeah, you're 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 supposed to say, see you next mission. There you go. (laughs) I I thought I'd just finish it with next mission. (laughs) Uh, I I will say it in the, I will say it like we did at the end of Metroid Prime for some reason. Mission final. Yeah, I didn't understand that. Why did you call it mission final? Such a. I have thing. no idea. I don't know. Oh. There we go. Well, there's one for the outtakes. Yeah. No, we're just gonna put- <laughs> See you. Ne- oh, here we go. I'll, I'll, I'll get you a clean one. Go for it. See you next mission. Excellent. That's all we wanted. See you next mission. Yeah. See you next mission. That's, See you next mission. That's, See you next mission. That's, that's, mission. Yeah, you can, mission. You can, you mission. 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 This podcast was edited by Darren Kerwin and Giulio Bruschini. You can find more episodes at shinesparkers.net forward slash podcast. And we can be found on social media. Just search Shinesparkers on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. See you next mission.